One of the most important conversations happening right now in the yoga world is the issue of consent or lack thereof in yoga classes. It's certainly something that's going to be addressed in today's episode. And it was the main topic of discussion in my weekly teacher's class this week. Fortunately, I happened to be traveling in New Zealand and I was staying with Donna Fari and she jumped in on the meeting and dropped some serious knowledge on us about what consent means and how it's not just about consent cards. And I just think this is important education that yoga teachers need to be engaging in, need to be having these kinds of dialogues and conversations so that we can create a culture around yoga that is safe. And if you're someone who's feeling like you're lacking in this regard, or just in general, if you feel like you want to have an opportunity to bounce your ideas and learn off of other teachers, then I want to invite you to join us. It's the J. Brown Yoga Weekly Teachers Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, it's time. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If you're new, let me welcome you. If you're returning, how's everyone doing? So I'm still traveling. I'm in Auckland, New Zealand right now. For the last week, I've had the good fortune of hanging out with Donna Fari. I want to tell you about that, but I'm not going to do that today because today... I'm going to forego my usual intro stuff because I have a very special and important conversation with Karen Rain that I want to share with you. And I just don't want to let my stuff get in the way. And it's a little bit longer than my usual episode. That's because we recorded initial conversation. And then after that conversation, Karen requested that we do a follow-up. So you will get to hear both of those today. One thing I feel like I need to say before we listen to today's talk is I feel like I need to make an apology. I want to apologize to Annika Lucas. Annika came on this podcast and she told me that Patabi Joyce sexually assaulted her. And it's not that I didn't believe her. It's just that at that time, I didn't know what I know now. And I feel that I ended up diminishing her story. And I am committed to not doing that in the future. So I'm betting Annika's going to listen to this. And I just wanted to make an apology to her publicly, specifically before we listen to today's talk. So for whatever that's worth. Also, I do need to mention that today's episode is sponsored by yoganatomy.net. And that is the educational resource of Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews. And I've talked about them a lot because they're both friends of mine and teachers of mine. I've taken both of their courses. They've been on the podcast. I encourage you to go back and listen to the episodes. But they have a fundamentals course that is fantastic. I use it in my own teacher training program. If you have a teacher training program, you could easily plug it into yours. Or even if you just want some continuing education, it's an invaluable resource. So if you or anyone you know needs to study some yoga anatomy, or maybe you just want some deep yoga learning, I highly recommend you check it out, yoganatomy.net. Also, I've got a couple of gigs. Let me drop those too. I'm going to be in London, England, January 11th through 13th, and Tel Aviv, Israel, January 18th through 20th. You can find those gigs and more. You can listen to the archives of the podcast, find the blog, and all my online yoga video stuff at jbrownyoga.com. All right. So I will touch base with you on the other side. I'll tell you who's coming on next week. But for now, we're just going to get to this. Let's listen to this talk that I had with Karen Rain. All 
Hi, Karen. Hey. <laughs> How's your day been going? It's pretty good. Um, I rode my unicycle this morning, which was fun. Um, I'm in my I'm in the bedroom with one of my cats, so if, no. uh, if they decide they want to go out, I might have to get up and open the door. But <laughs> that's fair. Duly noted. Duly noted. Yeah. <laughs> And also, that's cool. You brought up the unicycle. I was going to ask you about that. We'll get to that later. Okay. And it even makes me, you know, right now, sitting here right now, I'm in a bit of pain myself. I have some body pain issues right now. Uh Uh-huh. And I was thinking about the fact that I remember you saying that riding a unicycle did some pretty great things for you. It helped stabilize my spine. Yeah. 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 Um, So. And I like being outdoors. I like, uh, so. And just that, unicycles, that nice. unicycles are fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a great way to... Uh, they, get, they get people to smile, for sure. <laughs> what a great way to do core strengthening, you know? Yeah. yeah. It, was to, it, was to, it was to stabilize my core. That was why I took it up. Huh. Yeah. Right. Well, 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 maybe we'll get to that. Okay. I guess, <laughs> I guess the other thing I want to say is that, you know, we chose a really strange day to do this. Like, tomorrow's the election. Oh, right. Yeah. And I, yeah. I have to admit, I, I'm feeling a little bit out of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Got a lot Definitely. of anxiety so. about it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I was just so Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I was just talking to yeah. my wife this morning. She's like, are you ready for your podcast? And I was like, uh, yeah, I think so. And I was like, I felt weird. And I was like, why do I feel so weird? And she's like, the election's tomorrow. I was like, oh, that's right. I just feel like. Yeah. If the yeah. voting doesn't work, <laughs> what, happens? <laughs> what happens? Yeah. Well, you know, that also kind of brings me to some of why uh, we're talking today, because as I think I told you in our emails, I, I got so angry at the watching the Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, I, I was thinking of you a lot while I was watching them. Mm-hmm. It was devastating. It was Did totally you watch them? For me. No, I was actually in my car, um, and I, um, Dr. Blasey Ford was speaking. I was playing with the radio. I listened for just a moment where she just asked, um, "Could you please repeat that question?" And I, the, the sound of her voice, I couldn't bear it. Um, so I couldn't listen. And then on the way back, it was his turn and I put it on him for just a second. And I happened to get his most famous line where he said, I love beer. And I just <laughs> click, you know, <laughs> like, I can't, mm. I can't do this. <laughs> I don't know. It was a very, yeah. again, I, as I think I told you, I, our conversation that we had on the phone, however long ago it was now, I can't even remember. It was some while back. Mm-hmm. It really changed my thinking about a lot of stuff with the Me Too stuff that was happening. Mm-hmm. And when that, when he came on, that the strange thing about that was the way, like, his response was to get angry, mm-hmm. and then all these men rallied around him mm-hmm. and just got angry with him. Yep. And then mm-hmm. it worked. Yeah. And I went, "What? Right. 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 <laughs> what?" Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it was, it's it's crazy, yeah. and and I guess I also just thought, well, you know, when we spoke last was around when I did that series of podcasts on what was happening with the Ashtanga Yoga community, mm-hmm. and at that time, you and I, you know, you you thought maybe you would talk to me then, but then we thought better of it. It was so hot at that time, and I remember mm-hmm. thinking, and and I at, when we were sort of saying goodbye, I was like, well. Maybe we'll revisit again because I I suspicion that the conversation would recede and go away again. Yeah. And so I, after watching the hearings, I wanted to bring it back up. And I yeah. spoke with Gregor Mahal, and and he, that'll play before this. And I spoke with Jenny Wilkinson Priest, and and I and I'm glad to speak to you. I'm wondering. I know you recently put out a post on Medium, um, mm-hmm. and I'm just sort of wondering how. Since we last spoke, have you been keeping, have you been paying attention to what's happening? Have you not been paying attention? 
You mean within Ashtanga? Yeah, like, well, what's I, been happening since you came out with everything and since those conversations happened? Do you, have you been paying attention to anything that's been going on since? I wouldn't say I've been paying attention. I'd say people draw my attention to certain things. Um, the people will send me stuff or disclose to me something. Um, so I don't really know. I don't necessarily know the what the loudest or most common response is, but I know some of them. Well, the ones that I've been seeing, well, again, a lot of them haven't been a lot. Things have kind of gone quiet. Mm -hmm. But when I really did start to poke around, there seemed to be like a number of kind of statements happening, but on a purely grassroots level, like Guy Donahai, the author mm-hmm. of the book, he, he came out with a statement, which I thought was very significant. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and some of those folks, and even like I know some people in the UK are trying to start an alternative organization or something, but mm-hmm. it seems to me uh, nothing from sort of the organization or the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some folks who I just think are kind of like, drank some kind of Kool-Aid and are like in complete denial about stuff or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's other folks who are acknowledging what's happening and feel that, that it needs to be reinvented or who are struggling because they, a lot of them still really love the practice, mm-hmm. but they're like ashamed to say they're a stronger practitioners mm-hmm. or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they're scared or they're, they feel persecuted, which you know, is also maybe a defense mechanism, but, but on some level they are, it's not, people aren't feeling comfortable to be out about being Ashtanga practitioners because the person at the head of that school was shown to be an abuser. Really? I haven't noticed that response. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So you're seeing still just a whole lot of deflection and denial and. Yeah. I don't know anyone who's having the response that you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. That's what I mean. I think there's pe- on an individual <laughs> level, there's people saying that, but uh, they think there's still a broader uh, community of people who are, are still, I think people in general who are still not able to take in the reality of it. I don't think anyone's able to take in the reality of it. I'm not into, able to take in the reality of it. Mm. Uh, I don't think, I don't think anyone really realizes how bad it was and um, how much denial there was, how much enabling, how much denial, how, how I was speak. I am in contact with Jubilee cook um, and speak with her and email with her and stuff. And we were, we were talking about how, how many women were probably sexually assaulted. She knows of five women in Seattle who were uh, either in Mysore or in Seattle on one of Patavi Joyce's trips. So she knows that there were more than that. But if you look at that and just go city by city that he, he toured in and multiply that by five, plus the women he assaulted in Mysore on a daily basis, which was a lot. It, we're, we're looking upwards of a thousand women. And then you still have people who are arguing about whether or not it was assault or yeah. not accepting that it was assault or coming up with their own definitions of assault as opposed to the legal definitions of assault. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I meant. That's what I meant by denial. I don't think anybody can call accusations anymore. Like they're not they're not accusations accusations anymore. It's it's well established. Oh, I I totally agree. But yeah. I, there are still many people who are denying it. Yeah, there are many many people who are denying it, and there are many people who are de- denying how many people were assaulted. How many people were assaulted? There's also other issues around Patavi Joyce that people are in denial about. There's there's the predominant story of Patavi Joyce that was written in the book Guruji that shows none of his quote unquote flaws. Um, he, he wasn't just unethical in how he 
abused women. He was uh, he lied, cheated, and stole money from people, and no one mentions that. It's mm-hmm. overlooked, mm-hmm. and I think I think unraveling it is really important. How did this happen? I'm not saying that this man was that you can't love someone who was a sex offender or you can't love someone who lies, cheats and steals, but he was immoral and he was not. So he was not a great yogi, right? I, according, not according to Patanjali's yoga sutras. He did not teach or practice the yamas. He was not a great yogi, but he was made out to be a great yogi. And, 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 People studied with him. They venerated him. They continue to when it's what he did is in intrinsically contradictive of what a yogi is. It would be different if he was a great furniture maker. You could still say he was a great furniture maker even and be unethical. But you can't say he was a great yogi and be unethical. So how did this atrocity happen? How did this happen? And, uh, I, you know, I know my own journey. Well, that's what I was going to I was gonna ask. Maybe you could help us unravel it. I was also going to say, you know, furniture makers, after they're exposed to be sexual abusers, don't have their pictures still up on altars. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and while, yeah, I would not want to study furniture making with, <laughs> a sex offense with a serial sex offender or someone who was going to rip off my money. I might, I could say, yeah, he was an excellent furniture maker. Right. Right. But I can't say about Patabi Joyce. He was a great Yogi. He sexually assaulted many, many, many women on a daily basis. And he lied, cheated and stole money from people. You cannot say that's a great Yogi. It's not just a that, flaw. That's an important point. I, I, it's a really important point because people always want to separate teachers from teachings. But I think I'm going to agree that sexual assault disqualifies you from being considered a master yogi. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're going by. If you're, if you're, I, I don't, don't think someone could be called a master yogi if <laughs> sexual assault has been in their behavior. I just don't think I, it, that's. He chose the uh, he chose the name Ashtanga Yoga. Right. From Pat- Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, especially if you're going by Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, that just doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because some one of the criticisms that I get sometimes, um, and particularly there were two with the lat- with the with the article that was um, published for Medium, mm-hmm. that uh, two people said that's that's real traditional yoga and were insulted me that I was just some stupid Westerner who couldn't tell that that was real traditional yoga. Yeah. And it's interesting because just this morning, I don't know if you saw it, but a woman from yes. Bangalore. Yes. Yes. The uh, illustrated uh, woman's guide to yoga abuse. Is that what you're uh, going to bring up? Yeah, um, I saw it. It's really uh, good. <laughs> yeah. Her name is Ponga Mali and it's yeah, the illustrated woman's guide to yoga abuse. And it's great. And, for me, it shows that no, besides that I knew anyway, but <laughs> just, mm-hmm. it, it just defeats that argument about how this was traditional and cultural and whatever. Yeah, yeah I think that's important, too, that, that he did that to women in India, not just in America. Right. And also his wife was alive most of the time that I studied with him. Um, she died at the end of 2000, uh, uh, no, of 1997. Um, I had already spent 22 months in Mysore. Well, let's, let's go back to that. When did you start? Did, first of all, I'm curious, did you practice other yoga before Ashtanga? Um, okay. So I don't, I don't actually like talking too much about the pre, my pre abuse yoga experience because it makes me really sad. Um, I loved, I loved 
Ashtanga yoga. I loved yoga, and then I found Ashtanga yoga, and I loved Ashtanga yoga. It gave me a sense of meaning and purpose and joy and vitality. And for me, it definitely was um, an antidepressant. Um, and Patabi Joyce sexually assaulted me and spiritually abused me. He robbed me of those things. That's what spiritual abuse is. He robbed me of of what was what was meaningful to me, of what was deeply personal. And uh, it's just really not fun for me to talk about that time. Um, I can talk about regaining that because I think what I'm doing now, uh, I didn't realize when I came out with my hashtag Me Too statement, and it's definitely been quite a journey um, since then. And I think you can hear in my in my interview with Matthew, my voice is shaking. I'm... I'm down. <laughs> yeah. um, I think my voice probably sounds a little bit different in this interview. Um, I'm still nervous. Yeah. And Me I'm, too. I may, I'm nervous too, yeah, for whatever yeah. that's worth. I may always be nervous when I talk about this, but I can say I, that I feel that my spirituality has pivoted towards justice and civic engagement, and I feel a new sense of meaning and purpose and joy and vitality in, in speaking truth to power. Right. I appreciate that so much. And yeah, I, I hear you. So I guess I'm just, not everybody listening might really know who you are. And I only know, okay. I only know who you are because of the infamous video, like right. The, right. The, that primary series video, which like everybody in that video went on to have these, like whatever yoga careers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you were in the, you didn't. <laughs> And now right. we know why. Right. Um, right. And, right. <laughs> and, I, and for anybody who was like coming into yoga, like in New York in the early nineties, like me, there was a whole, I think the Ashtanga yoga community was different back then than it is now. Um, yeah. I, I don't know it now though. So yeah. I couldn't really speak to that. But you did, you spent, what was that? You said 22 months in Mysore? I spent, uh, no, well, I went back after that was before Ama died, um, and then I went back again, and I just think I spent two or three months. I don't remember what it was mm. after that in uh, 1988. That was my last trip. So yeah, my point was though with that little story. Let me just finish it. Where so she was alive, and he was besides the sexual assaults within the class when women would prostrate to. To, to say goodbye to him, he would then kiss many of us on the lips and grope our buttocks. And he, in the afternoons when we would say go visit him and Amma, was, his wife, was, was there when it was just like a visit. It wasn't, it wasn't really uh, any, anything other than a visit. Like, like it wasn't a lesson or anything. Um, when, when we would prostate there, he would never kiss us on the lips or grope our buttocks in front of Amma. So this shows intention. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Mm-hmm. And it also shows that it shows the misogyny of the situation. And it makes me sad that I even drank, that I drank that Kool-Aid because it, it, to me, Ashtanga yoga at that time and now, and this is why I keep speaking about it, it was and is an exaggerated caricature of rape culture. Not only did he disrespect women, he disrespected his wife. People can't, uh, I mean, what do people think that he and Amma had this open relationship and he told her what he was doing to women in the yoga class and she was okay with it? I mean, I really doubt that. Well, that's, that's true. I know. I also noticed, you know, I was surprised you sent me that link of that video of the full right, class. 1982. And I, I right. watched that 1982 video and, you know, it's startling. And what I noticed was he did not do the same adjustments to the men that he did to the women. Right. But he is, did not. Is, it was so obvious. Everybody says that. They're like, oh, he did that to everybody. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. But I also think that that is the funniest argument I've ever heard. Yeah. Imagine using that argument for priests. 
saying, well, the priests, they did the same thing to young girls as young boys. So I don't think it's sexual abuse. I think it's something else. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't. Right. And, and I, did, I have heard two stories about him sexually assaulting men. Um, one, the man just thought he, that Patabi Joyce mis, mistook him for a woman because he had long hair, but it was he, he went up from behind him and grabbed his genitals. Um, and who knows? I mean, maybe he knew he was a man. Maybe he didn't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's sexual assault in any case, right? Well, I think that's an important Having point. someone's genitals is sexual assault regardless of the gender of the person. Yeah, I quoted your article in that regard. It's like if you wrote, yeah. if someone grabbed a woman's breast, genitals, or buttocks on the street, digitally penetrated or dry humped her, it would be sexual assault. We would not ask the perpetrator's motives. If he had an erection or if, it was th- if he was thinking sexual thoughts at the time, none of that changes the crime which is right. power and aggression. Right. And, and you wrote, yeah. the women may brush it off, like it's no big deal, but it, and it doesn't really bother her, but it's still sexual assault. Right, exactly. And it, and it doesn't, that's another thing that I'm finding now with, with the rape culture of, of the Ashtanga community and rape culture in general. I, there's so many similarities, actually. The only difference is that I haven't heard that one argument in other situations that, oh, that perpetrator did the same thing to men as women. That seems to be really unique. (laughs) And not even true. That's the thing. (laughs) Right. Right. But uh, yeah, it's just so so absurd, but um, there are so many similarities. I guess, I guess the other question I have is in the conversations I have with people, Mm -hmm. it sometimes seems in my mind, like there's two different threads and maybe they're not different. One of them is sexual assault, is him touching women, body parts, putting his penis up against them. Yeah. Uh, and then mm-hmm. the other is just what I think are sometimes the the hard, abusive the uh, adjustments. Assault. Just, just the physical and, assault. And everybody yeah. experienced those in one way or another. Right, right. And have right. a different relationship to them. And I talked with Matthew about somatic dominance, you know. Mm-hmm. And... I, do you think they're on different threads or are they the same thing? Or is it still just a power? Oh, I think it's still power. It's power. It's totally power. Yeah. I, I do think to me, I, and I talked with Jenny about this, like she was talking about leg behind the head. And I, at some point said, well, well, why, why do we need to get our leg behind our head? <laughs> and there wasn't really a clear answer. Now I can't, you know, people have their own purposes in their yoga practice. So I wouldn't, assert anything other than what they want it to be but i i i think sometimes i question you know just the forms in and of themselves but i Mm -hmm. guess the issue for me not really issue i guess the question is when we talk about consent which is the other side of this Mm -hmm. now in the yoga world a lot of times consent is often based on the person deciding that they were made to feel and be uncomfortable how do you mean like in the sense that they often say that consent means that the, that the often the woman, or I guess it doesn't have to be the woman. Um, you know, if that woman was made to feel uncomfortable, then it was inappropriate in a way, or that then the, it was non-consensual. That it was non-consensual. Exactly. And so well, the rubric, that's, that's, the rubric is the experience of that person. But that's in retrospect. Yeah. If you don't have a consent culture, there's not consent anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. There wasn't, there's not, there was not a consent culture in Ashtanga yoga by any stretch of the imagination. So there couldn't have been consent anyway. Now, if you go, if you're, well, my kitty wants to go out. Hold on. Okay, go, go let her out. (laughs) We knew it might happen. And then there it is. Let her out. Now, if you're in, I'm back. So if you're in a consent based culture and someone is checking in or let's say it's two people who are having an interaction and they're both checking in and someone says that doesn't feel okay and the person who's doing whatever it is stops immediately 
that's consent. And a person experienced an uncomfortable moment, but they were they communicated it and it was stopped. That's still consent. It's not like, oh, you have to be perfect and you can you have to know what the other person wants. That's not what consent is about. It's about being open to feedback always. It's an ongoing conversation. Right. And you said in order for that to happen, there needs to be a consent based culture. Right. And that's what I I don't I don't think it's just the stronger yoga that there's not a consent based culture. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I yeah. think and a lot you know, even myself in my own evolution as a teacher, you know Oh, in my own evolution as a person, I didn't know what consent was when I was younger. Yeah. I, in terms of its usage as now consent culture, what do we what do we see in the in the movies? We see usually they're heterosexual pairs, but we see the male grabbing the female, kissing her passionately. At first, she's not sure, and then oh, she figures out she really likes this guy, and she's really into him, and then they have great sex. Like what? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what. That's not consent. Yeah, I know. And there was a great. I heard a great series of podcasts on Radio Lab about this. Mm-hmm. Um, about how how even sometimes women just uh, there's not a culture in which they can communicate it, and sometimes they were even just just to get out of it. They will allow for things to happen, and then they feel afterwards they have to reckon with that you know totally we're dealing with harm control yeah like i just want this to stop um i don't want to be harmed i don't want to get this guy angry i don't want to be harmed um there's there's a great article i forgot Oh, why I made my rapist breakfast. I definitely, I'd love for you to include a link to that, okay. but it, 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 it describes that and it, yeah. And we are taught men know better than us, our own desires. They can kiss us passionately and make us melt whether we're into it or not at first. Yeah. You get really dumb messages as boys. I mean, yeah. And yeah, and you're getting the message that you could do that, right? You're not you're getting supposed to. That's what you're. So that's what right. being a man right. is, or something. Right, right. You're not getting the message that oh, you should ask, and if they say no, you should, uh, <laughs> you should just quit. <laughs> you're getting the message. Oh, if they say no, just ask again, or maybe they're still, in, maybe they are interested, or whatever. You know, you're not getting the message. Just quit and leave her alone. She told you she didn't want to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and that. I mean, that conversation doesn't happen often in yoga classes when someone comes over to give an assist. Right. Or, or they, if sometimes they call them adjustments. I always use the word assist because I don't, I don't consider right. them adjustments. Pe- people have changed it. Definitely when I was, when I was doing yoga, it was called adjustment. I, oh. I had never heard assist. I think that's newer. I mean, um, I remember going, checking out um, Ashtanga practice back, probably it was maybe 96 or 97. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I, it was too hard. I even, even though I was pretty hardcore, like showing up six days a week, except for it's, days it's early and those hard adjustments, I was it's, not down with that, you know? It's, like, it's, yeah. Not everyone's going to jive with that for sure. Um, yeah, the, there are, and that's maybe something we can get to too. I think there's a specific population for it to appeal to, but it's not going to appeal to everyone. And I think people should be honest about what the actual benefits are. And I do believe that there are, that there are some, but I, I think that there are a lot of voodoo health and spiritual claims about the benefits of Ashtanga yoga. And I don't think that that's transparent. Well, again, there's those same voodoo claims across all the yoga schools. All you know? yoga, it's yeah. all, yeah. I think yeah. the research coming yeah. out sort of debunking some of the origin story myths and science coming out, and new mm-hmm. science coming out, and mm-hmm. and we're talking, yeah, totally, <laughs> I totally agree. But um, so yeah, I think I think a lot of it is too is that yoga, the way it's taught. I, I only really know Ashtanga, and I only really know Ashtanga from long ago. But I don't know how much it's changed. Uh, is that it's it the culture is contradictory to consent culture. It, culture. It's a 
paternalistic culture where the teacher knows better than the student what the student needs. Whereas consent culture is that uh, a per- believes that a person is the best judge of their own wants and needs. And there is a deep respect for um, bodily autonomy, which is really different from Ashtanga yoga, where the teacher know- knows when you're supposed to stop practicing. They know when you're ready for the next asana. They know, you know, they're telling you what you need. You're not really able, you're not supposedly not able to figure that out yourself. Um, well, I spoke to Gregor about that specifically, and that mm-hmm. is what he was saying in terms of like the main thing that needs to happen in order for it to be reinvented. Because he still teaches like right. the forms, but right. he's he said exactly what he was referring to the hierarchical dualistic structures. <laughs> you know, he uses some big right. language, but right. he was talking about that being inherently um, setting up for this lack of consent culture. Totally. Uh, it's totally lack of consent culture. And so how to meet that. And, and plus the Ashtanga yoga practice is very circumscribed. As you said, six days a week, you take new moons and full moons off. And then there's the sequence. And what if someone doesn't feel like doing the sequence in that particular order or but it feels like throwing in a new asana or taking one out or whatever. There's not really a lot of room for that. Well, I know that that is something that has changed some, even in more whatever the, I don't know what you call it. I wanted to, I was about to say traditional <laughs> circles, but then I, <laughs> I thought better of it. But I would say that there, I know for a fact that back when I first checked it out in the nineties, late nineties, <laughs> it was like, if you couldn't do stuff, you got sent to the back of the room there was no resting, uh, and it was strict. And I do think that that has changed some, where they are a little bit more, I don't know, lenient about letting people rest or make changes to the forms. Um, yeah, one of the things I was thinking of that, that actually I had thought of when I could no longer do Ashtanga, uh, but I hadn't yet quit yoga, the way I had looked at it was okay. I've learned four and a little bit of five scales, say, musical scales. It's my analogy. And now I want to write my own songs. I want to create my own music with these scales that I've practiced thousands of times. I couldn't do it because of the abuse um, and the, the physical pain that I was in, but I was thinking that this is this could be part of some reinvention by someone if they were interested I don't know (laughs) that to look at it as because I think what I loved about Ashtanga was more actually the jumping back and jumping through Um, but it was the flow I thought it was beautiful when I saw it and um, that to give people more of there's not there's not like what you describe uh, how they've modified it now, it's really still not a creative endeavor. And I really like, obviously, creative expression. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't, I don't see why that can't be in yoga. I know that for some people, having structure, having an externally imposed structure, like here is the sequence, this is what you do, and you do it on these days and you don't do it on those days and you, you know, it's just very clear. They don't have to turn inward to, to look, to try to figure out, they don't have to make decisions about what to do next, Mm -hmm. but it does, it cuts off creativity and it cuts off. It does. It cuts off uh, self inquiry with a small S when, First of all, I think the musical scales metaphor is a good one because Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. I I use that metaphor, but in a slightly different way, which is that you can, you can learn to play scales really proficiently and be a totally uninspired musician. Absolutely. And then somebody who doesn't know any musical theory at all can pick up an instrument and play something totally brilliant. 
though. So I've always yeah. felt that too. Well, they would probably need to practice a little bit before they could Maybe, play something. Maybe, but totally. somebody could pick up a drum. And I don't know. I'm just saying it's very primal, <laughs> you know. But what I would say is that a lot of the people I've been talking to are trying to do what you said. They feel like they learned a bunch of scales and they learned they learned things and experienced things that were helpful to them in practice. And mm-hmm. they feel that they can use those things. But I, that's my question to them is, can you still call it a shtanga when you do that? Oh, well, it, that's it, not it, a question it, for me to answer. That's That <laughs> is, that is. Now, to I, other, I'm not doing it. So. Now, the other thing I would say is that myself, I have a very structured personal practice. Like, I do the same forms. That is something I kind of took from a shtanga. And I don't, but my, my structure is very simple. Like, they're super easy forms. They're not, like, at all very physically challenging. Mm-hmm. But... For me, that is actually helpful in terms of inquiry. Like I do the same forms every day, but they're not the same every day. And I observe those differences. So okay. I, I think that there is a way to use structure. And I, and I, I, I laugh about this and debate this with other teachers. I know other teachers who have even trained with me who they, would, they want to mix it up every time. It's much more of a creative expression like right. that for them. So this suits you. Yeah. I always say it's like personal taste. Like when I go out to dinner with my wife, I always get the same thing. And she goes, don't you want to try something else? And I go, no. Like it's, it's, sometimes it's just that. But what I want to say is that I do think when it is a dogma, you see, even with me, like no one has to stick to it. Like I don't have to stick to it and nobody else has to stick to it. It's just something for us to go off of as a place of inquiry. And when you have that as the context for the structure, not this is the right way to do it. And if you can show me you can do this one, then I'll give you the next one. Like that's a different, that's a different uh, context. And I also think that, okay, so you have this practice as you say, it's a structured practice that you've self-imposed on yourself. So you already did some experimentation to find it, some self-inquiry to find it. Now, let's say at some point... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.